8th of October, 1992, Rudolf Nureyev, the greatest dancer of his generation, was dying of AIDS. His last act was to stage La Bayadère, the ballet he danced in Paris as a young man before defecting from Russia in 1961. This is the story of his last 10 years at the Paris Opera Ballet and of his refusal to allow illness to interfere with the sustaining passion of his life, the dance. There was an opening night of Bayadère at the, yeah, the Paris Opera. There was a lot of TV, a lot of newspaper men, Everybody was waiting. The audience was very special because it was not a uh, usual audience. It was all the friends of Rudolf who came, like his whole life. The Bayadère was more than a ballet for Rudolf and for everybody around. This is the idea that I love about Bayadère, that you have someone approaching death who's dying, and instead of his death, gives this wonderful ballet. like very much his childhood, his poor childhood. He was sitting, uh, watching after the trains, uh, Siberian trains which go to Moscow, and he dreamt that uh, time will pass when some train will take me from this place uh, to the big world. At that time, I was Minister of Culture of my country, and uh, I wanted to give to our national opera a new uh, life, uh, uh, other uh, purposes. And uh, the ballet, the national ballet, was a good one, but there were many problems. To, to change uh, the situation, we had to find a man or a woman who could be able to give a new strongness to this ballet. For me, Nureyev was a sort of a god very far from earth, and I'm not sure that he could, he could accept this proposal. The Palais Garnier, which housed the Paris Opera, the Paris Opera Ballet, um, as you know, is a magnificently opulent, beautiful, you know, La Belle Epoque building. It is cavernous, it's enormous, it is an incredible city within a city. And because it is a civil servant, semi-quasi-governmental environment, you have all these different warring camps and factions within the ballet, within the opera, uh, within the overall administration. And of course, it is a, it is a, a living, breathing, artistic setting that when Rudolph landed, uh, you know, like the D-Day, invasion in Normandy, uh, no one at the Palais Garnier, at the Paris Opera administration, or down the street at the Ministry of Culture, realized that this was a whirling dervish, whirlwind, typhoon, tornado, monsoon, and that he was going to change everything, which he proceeded to do. when he asked me to come and join the Paris Opera, to come and work here. I mean, my first reaction was, he must be out of his mind, because they all sounded as though they were monsters. There were some real horror stories of the teething troubles that he'd been having with, uh, at the opera. 
which is inevitable given uh, you know, years and years of tradition and very stringent rules, uh, union rules including. And it's always difficult to get take this on board when you go, you go somewhere else. You think that you can do everything as and when you want and you can't. When I first came, he said, all you have to do with these people is love them. And it's absolutely true. When he arrived, I think first people was very proud and also very frightened uh, because uh, everybody uh, knew Rudolf Nureyev uh, first as a dancer and second as a character. Afraid. <laughs> I was completely afraid because he was so um, voluntary. The, the way he was going to the bar even if we, it was not a free place, he was just going, putting his hand on the bar and doing first was a plea. And I was afraid because he was so strong. He wasn't altogether very well received at first because he was always after people doing this is not the right way, this is not the right way, this is not the right way. I mean, from morning, from 10 o'clock in class until end of the day, it was no, 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 no. Everybody knows that some um, bottles of tea were just uh, flying in the studio. It we say, oh, you remember I did that step wrong, and uh, Rudolf said, wow, I am not happy, and uh, something was flying. Rudolf never discussed his reasons for accepting the position of, as artistic director in the Paris Opera, but it seemed to me a very natural progression. And I guess Paris seemed a logical place. I mean, he hadn't jumped over the barrier here. Uh, it seemed like it had gone full circle. The decision of Nouveyev has a signification politique, sentimental, or even tout simplement artistic. On ne sait. The day he defected, I remember it coming on the radio, and it was the leap to freedom, and it was so romantic, and it was this combination of the political, the political leap and the dancer's leap, and, you know, what it did for Rudolph was it made him an international celebrity before he'd ever danced more than one night in the West. He was truly the first superstar. I mean, he was bigger than Elvis. Uh, it's hard to believe that, but he was. He was bigger than the Beatles, and that legend continued right to the end of his life. Rudolf was such an extraordinary person that um, just to be seen with him made you feel, made you feel as extraordinary as he was. Uh, and, and this man, as I said, could walk into a room and, and change the atmosphere of a room just by entering. He was so beautiful that when you were first in his presence, it was almost shocking. He had something about him which the, the, the most straightest of men, if you watched him on stage or even in the street, make the hair stand up on your, on your arm. To have been Rudolf Nureyev young and have every man and every woman in the ballet madly in love with you and the ones who hated your guts drinking themselves to death because they couldn't stand that you had ever been born, to be that powerful in a large group of beautiful, gifted people. You couldn't believe it. The look of the company changed very quickly. And the the, the standard went like this. Suddenly went more uh, up to date, more.